Hello, Westwood Hills Christian Church. Today, before we get started with scripture, I would like to wish you a happy Palm Sunday, as today commemorates Jesus Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem as the crowds gathered and they laid palms on the street beneath him to celebrate him. Now we will take our scripture reading for 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Luke 12, 6 and 7. What is the price of five sparrows? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. John 3, 16 and 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. You just heard today's scripture reading and now we turn our service over to Pastor Joseph McCarthy, located in Fullerton, California at Hope International University. Pastor Joe. Well, hi, and happy Palm Sunday. I'm out walking the Beagle, because I have learned, as Jim Quick taught me, when the body's moving, the brain is grooving. I think that's true of the spirit as well. You know, it's really in our Western mindset that we think the body, mind, and spirit are three separate entities. We are spirit and body and mind and uh, which is a representation of our triune god father son and holy spirit so three separate persons in one god so i i highly recommend that you maintain all three of those things right keep your mind your body and your spirit healthy because they all are intertwined and affect each other but you've tuned in today i hope for a little spiritual food spiritual insight which I just, I know that doesn't come from me. It comes from the Spirit of God and from His Word. And so hopefully I am tapped into that today and will flow through me to you and uh, be of nourishment to your spirit. So Palm Sunday, as most of you would know if you grew up in the church at all or have been around the Christian tradition, is celebrated as the Sunday prior to Jesus crucifixion and the Sunday prior to Easter of course. The scene is well known among Christians who uh, study the scriptures that Jesus enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and he's riding on a donkey and the crowd goes nuts, right? Because this is towards the end of his three years of public ministry and he's healed lepers, he's raised Lazarus from the dead. The reputation has preceded him right, that this is a miracle worker, whether or not they believed he was the son of God was still up for grabs, but they knew he was a celebrity, right, he, he was the influencer of his day, so he comes into Jerusalem this Sunday morning, and the crowd's going wild, they're in, a, they're in a Beatles frenzy, right, and they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, right, they got the palms waving, they're doing everything that was appropriate in that culture that would be like for a rock star, a rock band arrives into town, Wow, you're so awesome. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's that's the Bible words, but it's like fan frenzy. And so Jesus is getting all the accolades and they're waving the palm branches. And it's like having the cell phones up with your with your light on at a concert, you're turning it on and on, which in the old days was it would have been raising your lighter. The crowd's going nuts and they're they're yelling, they're singing. They're so happy that Jesus is here. They're like taking off their clothes throwing it down to make a trail for him to ride on so he doesn't have to his dunk doesn't have to be on the street and seriously it's 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 a modern day rock star showing up or a top sports athlete before the game going in the crowd's all lined up to get a signature or just to be in the presence of somebody cool and although the scripture isn't overtly descriptive about what Jesus was thinking in those moments um, we all know that he as God, he knew what was coming. So it wasn't like he was like, yeah, thanks, I am so great. 
bring it on. You know, he was thinking, oh, out of great compassion and love, if only you knew what you're saying. If you only knew what was coming, right? But he did. So it was just a few days later before he's on trial. One of his closest friends betrays him for 30 pieces of silver. I don't know exactly how much that was worth, but maybe a couple of months wages, maybe a year's wages. And Jesus gets arrested. But that part of the story is still to come. That's Good Friday. Not good for Jesus, certainly good for us, the day he was crucified. Not because of anything that he'd done, but he became the perfect spotless sacrifice for all the rest of us. This has been a, a really profound week for me personally. Um, I really felt in a way I haven't in a long, long time, the palpable presence of God in my morning meditation and prayer time. Uh, earlier this week, I had um, a really difficult conversation with my wife, uh, disagreement and emotions were raw. And so I went to bed that night just grieving, you know, the, the pain that we had expressed and caused to each other. And I woke up the next morning and was quiet before the sun even came up and just decided, you know, it's a good thing to pray about, right? What isn't a good thing to pray about? And basically my prayer was kind of one word, why? And it wasn't like a why me, it was just a, an inquisitive, curious, why God? I've been married to this woman who I believe you handpicked for me for 24 years and still having this tension from time to time, kind of a recurring argument on why? What, why, what's going on? And as I was kind of sitting there in the darkness, contemplating the why and just being very real and vulnerable and honest with God, suddenly these words came to me and it wasn't an audible voice, but it was clear in my mind's eye. It was like the words were being handwritten and they formed in front of me. And as I started to read them, again in my imagination or in my spirit, the words were this, Joe, your value, your intrinsic value is neither determined by nor dependent on anyone else's approval, including your own. And I was, what? Wait, what? And, and look, it comes again to me, and I've written it down since. It's so profound for me in that moment. Joe, your intrinsic value is neither dependent on nor determined by anyone else's approval, including your own. And I was thinking, oh, this is, there's a, <laughs> this is good. This is God. There's a purpose why God is telling me this in this moment. And it's an answer to my why question, my curious question, why God? And it wasn't a direct answer like because X, Y, Z, although it was, because what's implied in this word is that I have been measuring my worth, my value, how I feel about myself based on the approval of others. And I wasn't even fully aware of it, right? I guess sometimes we aren't fully aware of our own limitations. And that's what the Holy Spirit can do. And God's word is illuminate the truth that can set us free. So as I look back over my life and I, I see authority figures and father figures and bosses and coaches and teachers and band leaders and how I craved their approval, not just their attention, but their approval because of the own brokenness and dysfunction in my own experience, in my own uh, family, and even in my church. And so this is profoundly life-changing, right, as God's Word can be. That what I knew to be true in my head, in my brain, in my mind, was finally sinking down that long, long distance from between my ears to my heart, right? distance from here to here is sometimes the longest distance in the world. And the truth of God's word that was always there is being revealed to me in a way that it went beyond head knowledge, but now to heart knowledge. That my value, your value, is neither dependent on nor determined by anyone else's approval, including your own. And I have had to think about that and remind myself now every day. I, wrote it down and I read it and I realize 
there's two parts to this, right? One is, as I've mentioned, is that for many, many years, since I was little, and things went haywire at home, uh, I have been searching desperately for the approval of authority figures and father figures in my life. But that's not, that's not the problem, necessarily. The problem is that I've evaluated my worthiness based on someone else's approval putting onto someone else what they should never have and that's the ability to evaluate or determine my worth because my intrinsic worth is not based on anybody's approval it's based on the fact that God the creator of the universe created me right that Psalm 139 if you've never read it or if you have you should read it perhaps every day I should read it every day that I am fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of the creator of the universe and if that's true then I have to believe that God does not make junk. God doesn't make trash. He doesn't even make mistakes. So who I am, who I am as a human being made in the image and the likeness of God, as it says in Genesis, that alone makes me invaluable. There is no price tag. There is no limit on the value of me or you as a creature, a human sentient, being made in God's image that alone determines my value now I might be broken right I am broken so the clockmaker makes an exquisite clock and due to circumstances and things out of my control and things in my control the clock's been smashed it's like sometimes it feels like the sledgehammer of life has just shattered the pieces but still that doesn't make me less valuable because the creator of the clock, the clock maker. One, he doesn't hold it against me that I've been smashed, right? And two, he has the power to restore me to the fullness of what he intended, of the way he created me and why he created me. And that's a process, that's still in process. And that process won't be completed until I transition from this life into eternity, where I will be perfect, perfect the way God had intended way he created me to be. Not only is my value, my intrinsic value, not determined by nor dependent on anyone else's approval, that includes my own. So in the light of self-help and personal development and growth strategies all around us, it's easy to think that I can make myself more valuable by doing stuff, right? That by improving myself and developing my skills and getting better at my habits that that makes me more valuable that's but that's the false that's a false equation my value has nothing to do with what i do or what i accomplish i'm not a human doing i'm a human being you are not a human doing you're a human being and quite honestly my approval of myself is all over the map sometimes i see the value of who i am and the way God made me, and I'm grateful for it. And sometimes I don't. Sometimes I think, what am I worth? Sometimes I feel worthless. And sometimes I just feel worthless, right? That if someone doesn't approve of me or I don't approve of myself, I don't feel worthless because I know that God loves me, but I feel worthless. Quite honestly, that's, that's like a false narrative. That's a bad equation because my intrinsic worth is not determined on what I do or even how I feel. What is it determined by? It's determined by two things. When we hinted at one, that I'm created by an infinite loving God in his image. So already I am invaluable as God's creature, as God's creation. But God proved how much he loves me and how much that I am worth through his actions, not just his words, but his actions. And what did he do? He sent his son, his one and only beloved son, who had been with him from time and eternity, before time and eternity, who was with God and was God and created all that there is, right? The word, which is Jesus, becomes flesh. How that works, I have no idea. Nobody does, right? It's a theological question that, that we can't bend our mind around. But Jesus, comes not just to show us the way or show us the potential that we all have, which he did, but also 
to show us how much God loves us. God loves us so much, just the way we are, but so much that he won't leave us that way, right? He won't leave us in our brokenness. He wants to put us back together to restore us to the glory for which we were intended, to restore our relationships with others, to restore our relationship with the earth, to restore our relationship with ourself, and to restore our relationship with him, of course, ultimately. That's what Jesus' mission was. And there was a cost, right? There was a price that had to be paid. And again, this speaks to my intrinsic value. If God sees me, if God sees you as worth the ultimate price that which he paid to have me in his family, that he would sacrifice his own son, that Jesus would come in great humility and love and suffer all of the indignities and atrocities and pain that, that earth can bring and be betrayed by his friends and misunderstood and crucified for sins that he didn't commit. In fact, he didn't commit any sins. Why? Because you and I were worth any price. Because as God's children, as God's creation, God show us how much he loves us and how valuable we are by the price he paid for us, right? That's how you know how much something is worth. And in spite of the scripture saying otherwise, somehow we think that, oh, well, Christ died for me or God loves me because I offered this, because I did that, because I have something to bring to the equation, which is not true either. Another false narrative. Romans says it very clearly. While we were still sinners, sin just means you missed the mark. It's an archery term. While we're still sinners, while we're still off the mark, got a bad aim, right? We haven't learned how to wield this fabulous instrument that we call our bodies, our reliance on our hearts. While we're still sinners, we're still all way off the mark. Christ died for us. And in another scripture says, we were God's enemies. We were just far away from him. We were actually God's enemies. And out of his great love for us, out of his desire to be reconciled, to, to restore his family, he paid the ultimate price. So when Jesus says to love our enemies, he's not asking us to do something that he hasn't done himself, right? Because we were God's enemies. If we're not on his side, we're on the opposite side. And in that state, before we did anything, before we proved we were love lovable or worthy, Christ died for us so that we could be forgiven, restored, and be adopted into his family. Not because of anything that we had done, but because he saw us as worth it. Because he created us, and he loves us, and he wants to restore us. And he knows we can't do it ourselves. And so those words ring true and deep that my worth, my intrinsic value, your worth, your intrinsic value is neither dependent on nor determined by what anybody else thinks of you or if they approve of you or not. Even if you approve of you or not, because we don't see it. We don't see the fullness of who we are. We don't recognize our greatness sometimes. We don't see ourselves as God's children made in his image. So we undervalue ourselves and we undervalue others, but that doesn't change what they're worth. If you ever watch Antiques Roadshow, or you've even been to a garage sale, or, or an antiques shop, or a bookstore, you've used books, sometimes you come across a book, or an antique, or an object that's way underpriced, right? So you find out on Antiques Roadshow that people found this certain piece of furniture in some shop off the road somewhere, and they bought it for 10 bucks, and they take it to the expert who really knows how to value these things, knows what they're really worth, and come to find out, you know, it was built in the 18th century by some artist, and they see all the, the markings that says, this is a rare and wonderful piece. This is worth $10,000, $100,000, $1,000,000. dollars So what I paid for it, the $10, right, how I valued it, is not what it's worth. But that's from my perspective. God is the expert. He does know what we're worth. He sees all the markings that he actually made because he was the creator of it. And he says, whether you feel like you should be sold at a garage sale for 10 bucks or given away for free, hoping that someone will actually just take you or worse yet, you think you belong in the dumpster. God's saying, 
Well, it's because you don't know. You don't know what I know. That you're exquisitely made in my image. You are invaluable. And you are so valuable, I would pay any price. I did, God says, I did pay the ultimate price for you because that's how valuable you are. So when I feel that judgment, that voice of judgment inside of me, that I'm feeling worthless or I'm feeling worthless, it's not only a false narrative, but it really is contradictory to the truth of God's word, right? In fact, if I evaluate myself or let somebody else evaluate me as worthless or as worthless, I'm actually giving them more power. I'm giving them more authority than the God of the universe who made me by saying that either their perception of me and what I'm worth or my perception of me and what I'm worth is really more in tune, is more accurate than what God thinks of me. That's ridiculous, right? Saying it out loud sounds ridiculous, but we do it all the time. So I guess what I'm saying is that when you feel devalued, either by others or by yourself, that is a lie. That's a deception from the enemy of our souls, but it's not God's word. It's not the truth that will set us free. The truth is we are made in God's image by an infinitely beautiful and intelligent God who makes no mistakes. And although we may broke, we be broken, we may be stuck in the mud, we may be covered with scars, that doesn't change our intrinsic value as God's kids. You know where diamonds come from, right? Well, first they start out as coal, and then under great heat and pressure, they become a stone, and not just a stone, but a precious stone because it's rare, because it's wonderful, because it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. But when you mine diamonds, you pull them out of rocks, out of darkness, out of, out of mud and dirt. They have to be mined. They have to be polished and cut. And sometimes that process alone of revealing the value that is already there, it doesn't make a stone more valuable by taking away the dirt and the rocks and the crud that's covering it up, what's already there. You're just revealing the beauty and the value and the worth. But sometimes it takes some polishing, right? Some grinding, like the stones in the rock tumbler. There's, there's, <laughs> in order to, to unveil the beauty, sometimes it just takes work. Sometimes that's the work that we do, and sometimes the work is the work that God does, and oftentimes it's both. I've heard it said that Michelangelo, widely considered the, the most amazing sculptor of all time, he's the one that sculpted the famous uh, statue of David, that stands in Italy as you know one of the most exquisite sculptures that's ever been done. And Michelangelo produced many sculptures. Michelangelo himself said words to this effect, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here, but he said, I don't create the beauty when I'm sculpting. It reveals itself. In fact, what I do is I just take away all the pieces that don't belong to reveal what's already there. This is a profound idea from, from the sculptor himself, right? That when he's got a block of stone, a block of marble, and it's just kind of just plain, when he is sculpting, he's not creating beauty, he's revealing the beauty that's there. How? By taking away the pieces that don't belong, the pieces that cover up the beauty. This is what God does. The great sculptor, the creator of us, we get covered with muck and mire and bad decisions and trauma and fear and all the stuff that hides the intrinsic beauty of who we are it doesn't change our value it just disguises it and so god by his holy spirit begins to chip away right and sometimes it's painful sometimes we don't understand well ouch why are you doing that that hurts i don't like pain so stop it and god says well if i stop it i i won't reveal the beauty that's there. It's through this process, and another way that the Bible describes it is the refinement of the fire produces pure gold. It doesn't create gold, it just takes away all the stuff that devalues the gold from the outside. And you know what else I love is that God says, you know what, men, women, they look on the outside. They evaluate others and themselves by the exterior. How do I look? How's my hair? How's my teeth? How do I look by comparison to others? How much stuff do I have? What am I wearing? 
all these extrinsic external things that we think are valuable but they all are just temporary but God that scripture says looks at the heart because the heart's where the true value is the heart's where the true beauty is so God is taking us as the Bible would say from glory to glory we were built in glory a, a child doesn't need clothing an infant doesn't need clothing or or great teeth or a liposuction or anything to be beautiful a, a life a brand new life a new baby is absolutely perfect in that moment glorious and then through life's traumas and experiences and misperceptions we start to cover up the glorious nature that we are both metaphorically and physically until we can't even recognize ourselves anymore and nobody else can recognize us either except for God the one who made us and so he is in the process of perfectly and painstakingly stripping away all of the baggage and the bandages and the stone that doesn't belong to reveal in us and through us the beauty that was already there the beauty that he had created in the first place we go from glory when we're born to glory when we end up in his presence the process of course doesn't feel too glorious in the moment but remember it's a process of God stripping away all the things that have covered up the intrinsic beauty and value of the way he created us to restore us to that place to bring us back to the garden right to bring us back to himself to the source of all beauty and love so I just reminding myself and you of the truth that was already there that your value your intrinsic value your worth is neither dependent on nor determined by anybody else's approval not even your own it's determined by the one who created you who paid the ultimate price because he knows you he loves you and you are worth it and he will continue to put the clock that's been smashed back together to refine you in the fire to chip away the hard stone to reveal the beauty that within if only you will accept it and receive it you don't have to do anything other than believe and receive and submit to that process and trust him trust the one who knows you best and loves you the most how freeing is that the one who knows us the best who knows everything about us loves us the most you know I think our insecurities my insecurities are that if people knew who I really was if they saw behind the masks and the veneer and what I present externally then they wouldn't like me as much right <laughs> well God's the opposite not only does he see past all that anyway he looks past the exterior and sees your heart but in all of your glory and all your brokenness he couldn't love you any more he couldn't love you any less because he is love and he's demonstrated his love for us that while we're still sinners are still missing the mark while we're still his enemies his son died for us remember that price tag there is no cost or value that's higher than to lay down your life for your friends this is scripture what's God saying there he is our friend we are his friends and he's laid down his life for us so that we not only can understand the infinite value of who we are but we can also help reveal that in others hmm. what a mission what a challenge may that truth set you free let us pray together thank you master for allowing us to again come before your throne of grace presently father there is such a season of utter heartache devastation and pain we pray, Master, for your divine intervention right now, tomorrow, and also in the coming days. Your Holy Word assures us that nothing is too difficult for you. We therefore stand on your unchanging Holy Word. Please continue to strengthen us in our walk and service unto you, Master. We offer this prayer in the resurrecting power of your Son, our Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. We pray that you come along with us again next week. So in the meantime, 
Be blessed. Be safe. Take care.